Hi, thank you for being here. So, um, first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Eniola Luco. Uh, Eniola, as you heard, um, is a graduate uh, from Brunel Law School. Uh, since then, she became a, a qualified solicitor, um, but also a broadcaster and um, an advocate uh, for um, really human rights and uh, non-discrimination in sports. So we will hear from uh, Eniola about her story. Eniola. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you. Everyone at Brunel, can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for Brunel uh, for having me here today. Um, it's always very nostalgic uh, coming back here after spending three years here um, on this campus. Uh, so I'm always very delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, so my story started in Birmingham. Uh, I grew up uh, in Birmingham um, and I grew up in the 90s, uh, born in 87 and uh, grew up in the 90s where girls didn't play football. Uh, there was no sort of girls football, women's football, uh, either on the TV or in my local area. So um, I was very much the odd one out um, from a young age. Uh, and sort of had this, you know, at the time, what felt like a very weird gift and talent of just being able to play football. No one taught me how to play, I just could play. And very quickly um, sort of found a group of boys to play with and realised that, oh, I'm better than all of them. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it quickly became my identity. Um, football was a big part of who I was. It, 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 it was the calling card for you know the boys to knock on my door and say, oh, is any coming out to play? Um, so it was a big part of, of who I was and, and, and my identity as a young girl growing up in a time when I couldn't see other girls doing the same thing. Um, so being the odd one out, I suppose, um, and that sort of dictated the arc of, arc of my life, being comfortable being the odd one out, I, I then um, played in school as well. I was the only girl in the school boys team and that that became, you know, part of my identity when I went and played other other schools um, and, you know, some parents who were bewildered by the fact that I was better than their sons would say, well, you know, who said a girl could, could play football? And, and that was difficult, right, at times as a young girl who just wanted to be validated, just wanted to be liked like a lot of young people do. Often, you know, I was questioned for just having the ability to play. Um, so from a young age, it was quite challenging being sort of this odd one out, having this ability that I wasn't able to see on TV. There was no pathway. You know, it's not like, you know, growing up as a singer. If you've got a talent as a singer, you know, OK, I can be, become a professional singer. It wasn't on my radar that I could become a professional footballer. So there was difficulties within that. Um, but fortunately, I was able to, um, you know, get into the England uh, squad from a young age. I, I got picked when I was 14. And that was really the first time I felt, wow, OK, this is something that, um, you know, gives me the, the privilege to, to play football on a serious level. Obviously, when you play for England, you then travel around the world to play as well. And... Again, you know, the, the question of identity came into that. Um, you know, I grew up in a Nigerian household. My, my, both my parents are Nigerian. And there was this, you know, sort of, uh, I call it this sort of balancing act that I had to do between uh, being a Nigerian girl in a very strong culture, but representing England and the sort of balancing act that I had to do um, and, and, and what that came with in terms of identity and, and who I was leaning into um, playing for England but and leaning away from, you know, being, being a Nigerian a girl. Um, but I was very fortunate to have played for England. Um, but as I said, because there was no pathway, um, for sort of professional fo girls football in this country. We all had to have jobs and we had to study. And so I came to Brunel and I, I um, became obsessed with the idea of becoming a lawyer um, through To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm sure everybody's heard of that book. Uh, so I was obsessed with Atticus Finch, the main character. And I said, right, I want to do law. 
Um, and, and from a young age, I was quite uh, disturbed by injustice. I was somebody that, you know, if that's wrong, I'm going to speak up about it. And that's, I suppose, the advocate, advocate in me was, was always sort of waiting to, to, to come alive. Um, so studying law here was, was, was tough <laughs> because many times I had to sort of um, balance it with playing and, and being in the gym. Um, but, uh, you know, studying law, I think, has really helped me throughout my life. Um, and I then became a trained uh, sports lawyer. And where the legal stuff came in and where sort of human rights came in was um, towards the end of my career with England. Um, the last two years of my career, I had a coach who um, made racist statements uh, towards me and other players. And for a while, I didn't say anything about it because as footballers, we just want to play, right? That's, that's what, you know, we're born with this desire to just play and, 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 and kick a football and you hope that life will be that simple. Um, but it was a very um, difficult culture to be part of. And I then had the opportunity to give a cultural review, a confidential culture review um, through, that the FA Football Association set up. Um, and unfortunately, those processes didn't protect me. So everything I said in terms of the, the comments that were made, the culture that meant that you couldn't really speak out, and if you spoke out, you'd get dropped from the team, all of those comments were, were leaked to the press. Um, and ultimately, the people who I was reporting to were ultimately protecting the coach and not the players. And so this became a very public case. You may have read about it. Um, and eventually I had to give evidence to the, the DCMS and um, we had a real moment in, in football in this country of how does football deal with discrimination? Um, how does football deal with discrimination against women um, who at the time weren't as prominent as the male players? Um, and and that, there was a real important conversation to be had there. Um, and I, and I, I lost my career, you know, I, I couldn't play for England again after that. Um, but I was very proud to be part of the change and the shift that meant that whistleblowing procedures um, improved, complaints procedures improved, which meant that I wasn't effectively, or me or any other uh, England player, wasn't effectively complaining to the person that was, you know, that, that, that was sort of guilty of the behaviour but actually there was independent processes. Um, so that was really important. UK sport were a big part of that. Um, the FA effectively had to be held to account by the government to change that. And I'm very happy now that it's a completely different football association. They're very aware of sort of discriminatory um, uh, processes and complaints and, and whistleblowing. And I think that was a, 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 a marker in the sand in terms of how female players were protected as well. And I think generally, um, through the development of women's football, um, we've seen sort of an equality movement um, that, that, is, that is developing, you know, whether it's equal pay, whether it's, you know, the sexism that, uh, you know, women in football have to deal with, whether you're on the pitch or whether you're um, working in the game, we still have a long way to go. Um, in terms of just the basic human rights, that women should feel safe in the workplace in sport, um, that women working in the broadcasting space should feel safe without, you know, the, the sort of casual daily online abuse that many women are, are, are subject to. And, you know, I'll, I'll end with this point. I think we're, we're in a place where there is a gap in the law around online regulation of sexism um, and misogyny. Misogyny is not a hate crime at this moment in time, but there's so much misogyny online. Mm. So the law has not caught up with, um, with, with, with you know, what's happening right now. Um, if you go on X, you just have to look at the comments. <laughs> under, you know, I could say I'm drinking <coughs> green tea and I will probably receive sexism and racism and misogyny and there's not much I can do about it other than suing, potentially suing the person. <coughs> so I think we've got, you know, a, an issue there where the law kind of has to catch up and build in frameworks and regulation. Um, so 
I'm happy to be part of that and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this conversation to help uh, move that forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Thank you so much, and a lot of issues that you raised. First of all, as a you know, as a young child um, playing, not necessarily professionally, but having obstacles in uh, practicing uh, sports as an everyday activity. I think it's important, and of course, the discrimination that existed um, later when you became a professional uh, footballer. But I think that also the the image and the uh, stereotypes that still um, uh, um, see. Uh, women in um, sports and how they should be and what they should be and what they shouldn't be. And I think that these are, and this intersectionality, you know, being a woman but also being of a different um, race and a different colour, you know, and the effect it uh, has had. And I think that, Elaine, also you faced something of this um, discrimination on the basis of um, um, various grounds, you know, including your religion. And Ellen Ba is a very brave um, young woman who um, raised these issues of uh, discrimination in France. Um, and um, Ellen um, has uh, created with others the um, Basket Pour Tout. Um, she's a basketball player and um, um, the Basket Pour Tout has been created in October 2023, um, part of a of the mobilization against exclusion um, on, on various grounds, uh, grounds by athletes. Um, and especially when it comes to um, wearing uh, sports headwear, um, headgear, and has, um, I think it's fair to say that in the same way that um, any story, any, uh, any other stories opened um, discussions uh, within the households, within our families about these issues that um, the British society had not seen before. Um, I think Elaine, um, maybe for the first time, brought substantial uh, questions that uh, France um, still has not fully answered uh, with respect to um, this kind of uh, discrimination. So do you want to tell us a bit more about your story? Thank you, Alexandre, and thank you for having me. Um, I like to say that I discovered discrimination while playing basketball, because I started playing when I was five, and also, although basketball is not like football, you know, there were a lot more women in basketball than in football. We still weren't many, and I was the only girl in my team, and so um, boys would, wouldn't want to pass me the ball, and they thought that I didn't belong on the court. Um, and now I'm 22, so we're 17 years later, and the problem is still sexism, but it's also associated with racism and Islamophobia, because um, we as Muslim women who wear the hijab are not allowed to play while wearing it because the French Federation of Basketball bans any religious equipment. And as you may or may not know, in 2017, the International Federation of Basketball, FIBA, overturned its ban on religious headgear and religious signs. But the French Federation of Basketball, don't ask me why, refused to do so. And so we are in this situation. Um, and things got actually worse because in, on December 2022, the French Federation of Basketball introduced a new article, Article 9.3, which prohibits any equipment with religious or political connotation. And it's an article that targets Muslim women because um, the regional league sent information and sent communications that specifically cite the veil. And so that specifically target Muslim women. And that article says that we should not be allowed to play if we keep wearing our sports hijab and we should stay on the bench. And this is what happened to me on December 4th um, when no one was aware of the existence of this new article because it was introduced without any warning. So I went to my game, it was a Sunday, I warmed up with my teammates and then the referee told my coach that if I wanted to play I had to take my sports hijab off and I had to uh, take off my uh, long sleeved t-shirt off and so I refused to do so and I, I ended up not playing and um, I know that a lot of women and girls like me have suffered from the same exclusion um, but I would say that I'm one of the most privileged because I knew this I knew 
<laughs> what racism, what Islamophobia was, and it was not the first time that I was, that I was uh, facing it. But I know that for some younger girls, it was the first time that they, they encountered discrimination. And so I do think that for them, it was hard and then for me. Um, and the story does not even stop here because this season, so September 2023, um, the, the rule officially came into force because it was a new season. And now we're not even allowed to sit on the bench we are with our teammates, so we have to go to the ladders. And the first time that it happens to you, is, it's always very shocking because um, they wanted you to be, to be invisible. They don't want you to be part of the game, part of the team. And so this is a new kind of, of violence. Um, and so s since October, we're now in April, I haven't been able to play any game. And I know that some girls haven't played since January um, 2023, so more than a year now. Um, and as you can guess, we didn't, remain silent and we try to organize. Um, so I'm representing Basket Porto tonight, but we, I'm not alone. Uh, there are also coaches, um, sp sport, um, a sociologist, a sports sociologist named Haifat Lili, uh, human rights defenders and coaches, basketball coaches. And so the first step that we took to try to overturn this ban was to uh, gather a local sport association, basketball association, and to write a letter to the French Federation of Basketball and to have it signed. It was signed by around 70 uh, local basketball clubs, which was a lot. Um, but this kind of backlashed because when the French Federation heard of it and when the regional, um, when the region, the Paris region heard of it, then the president of the Paris region uh, threatened to cut financing of the clubs that signed the letter, which is absolutely anti-democratic, absolutely illegal, but it, it was effective because um, in the end, many clubs um, um, decided that they didn't want to appear on, on, the, on the letter anymore. So we also tried to have some new allies, I mean, new and older allies like Amnesty International, who wrote a letter to the French Federation of, Gov of Basketball um, and we received an answer which was absolutely disappointing um, that did not respect human rights standards and that was completely, that completely disregarded what we lived and the reality on the ground. Um, we also received the support of the OHCHR, so of the United Nations, which sent a special communication to the French government because the French government, even though there is no national law, that prohibits religious science um, in sports. The government agrees, or at least does not um, stop Federation from passing such laws. And so um, we also received a, a, an answer from the government, which was also disappointing, disappointing um, and which was totally off subject. And um, that was really hurtful to, to, to read. Um, and we also appealed to international and professional athletes um, because I'm not one, <laughs> you are, I'm not a professional <laughs> athlete. Um, and 80 international and French athletes signed a letter in support um, of, of our campaign and uh, calling for the um, overturn of the ban. Um, we got the support of Athletes Ally and the Sports and Rights Alliance. Um, but then again, the French Federation of Basketball put pressure on the signatories and threatened um, to basically have the French players that signed not been selected um, during the Olympics. And so, as you can see, we've tried and we're still trying and we're still fighting, but it's hard because we're facing a lot of opposition because uh, the, the topic of Muslim women and Islam in France is very controversial and the government and the, and the national institutions are hiding behind a, a, the concept of laicité, which is uh, secularism, but it, that in France has a very particular meaning and, a very, and that's, that has been used in a very discriminatory manner to exclude Muslim people from accessing a lot of areas of, of life. Um, and, and so we're fighting, we're struggling, but we, we will keep on doing so. Um, and as you know, so we are supposed to, we will host the Olympics and Paralympics game in three months. And the French Ministry of Sports officially declared that Muslim women who wear the hijab and who represent France won't be able to participate with the hijab during the Olympics, sorry. Uh, and so this, 
In the Olympics. In the Olympics, yeah. And so, as you can see, this rule affects uh, both recreational sport and professional sport. It affects girls who are five years, not five years old, because they don't wear the hijab at five, but younger girls and older girls, professional, not professional, um, at the district level, at the Olympic level. And it affects, we are prevented from accessing the sports and we are prevented from having role models as well. And this is a terrible, um, this rule has a terrible consequences because it's a public health issue, it's a social issue, it's a racial issue, it's, it's a gender issue, and we are completely unheard uh, by the French government and by the French uh, federations. Um, and so we, we hope that it will change and we hope that the Olympics will be a moment of self-reflection um, by the French uh, government and the French federations. So just to um, understand, now you cannot play um, basketball if you do not take the, um, the, yeah. the headgear off. Yes. Whether you're professional or amateur. Yes. Yeah. It, it is amazing how some states and, and actors in the name of um, equality, the way they understand equality, um, actually treat um, women um, as, uh, as uh, taking away their, their human agency and treating them as, as children. Um, but, but you did come to the United Nations and um, my office did issue, like you said, a um, communication to France. France has said um, that in, in its response, uh, France really focused on education and uh, neutrality and not even address um, sports. Um, so it, it has been indeed quite disappointing, especially in view of um, uh, the position that the state has in um, uh, holding the Olympics in, in uh, less than six months. But you did go international at the international level, and I think that this is where Joanna Maran, and I was sure that I had it correctly, uh, Maran Miao, right? Maran Miao. Has, um, has, has worked um, recently. Um, Joanna is, has been in four Olympics, a swimmer in four Olympics, so a Brazilian Olympian, um, has won um, eight medals in the Pan American Games. Um, but unfortunately has also um, suffered uh, sexual abuse and since then she has become an activist and uh, uh, an advocate and a researcher. So uh, we're delighted to have her with us. Thank you so much. I'm also delighted to be here. Um, Celia Breckenwich, uh, for us who are working in safeguarding and harassment and abuse in sports, although there's still, there's still so much to do, we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for Celia. So it's such an honor for me to be in the space and in the university where she started. She was literally the first one back in the 80s who said there's a problem happening in sport. And it's just, and it's not a one case only. We still have to do it, but she was the one who started. And if we face retaliation today, I can only imagine what, what Celia has faced many, many years ago. So. Um, I do come from a place of personal lived experience. I suffered severe sexual violence when I was nine. Um, and I like to say I started swimming when I was three and I retired when I was 31. So it was like a long <laughs> part of my life. Um, and I like to say that I lived everything, everything. All the good and amazing experience in sport and also the worst experience in sport either. Um, and when I was ready to speak up, and it was when I was 21, um, Justice was not there for me because of the status of, of limitations in, in my country. I'm based in Germany, but I'm come from Brazil. Um, and, um, and then I thought, well, what was the reason for me to speak up? When I spoke up, other victims showed up as well. I was also um, harassed and sex actually abused by him. So there was no um, pathway to justice to my own story, but there was maybe something that I could do to others. So that's when I went to the Senate to try to lift the status of limitations in Brazil. Because back then, uh, when the victor turned 18, um, there was no access to justice. So I started advocating, talking to the to Senate and congressmen to try to lift the statutes of limitations, which we did. Um, and the law today carries my name. We haven't banned statutes of limitations in Brazil. In, that, in Latin America, Brazil is one of the worst countries, but there was definitely some development there. And I didn't know back then that what I was doing was advocacy. Um, but I just realized that that was what I wanted to do while also being a competitive swimmer. Um, and that was the, I speak up, spoke up in 2008 when I went to the 2008 Olympic Games. Um, and the law came in force in 2013, right after the London 
Olympic Games. So I was in an Olympic cycle trying to master the 400 I am while also doing it, advocacy. And it was moved by this sense of urgency, understanding that it wasn't just my case, there were so many Brazilians and athletes all over the world who were suffering the same thing, that I just didn't want to share my story over and over again. I wanted to capacitate myself. So I moved to Belgium to do a master's program in sports ethics and integrity. Um, my master thesis was a prevalence study on the extent of interpersonal violence among elite athletes in Brazil. Countries such as the UK, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, they have done similar research, but the results in Brazil were way higher, like 93% out of 1,083 uh, elite athletes have suffered some type of interpersonal violence. Uh, sexual violence was almost at 60%, physical violence almost at 50%. So we have this culture and this dome of silence. Um, Right after I finished my thesis, I was invited by the Sport and Rights Alliance to lead this consultation if there was a need and utility to build this international network of survivors. Because we have people uh, speaking up all over the world, but uh, we are, as we heard, we are constantly retaliated and silenced. And uh, unfortunately, sports governing bodies, they defend themselves rather than defend uh, the most vulnerable and the people who actually make the sport happen, which are the athletes who suffered different types of, of, of harm, as we heard here. Um, so building a network, the most important part for me wasn't to build a network, is what, how am I going to build a methodology that I can be respectful to people impacted by trauma? So uh, because anyone can be affected by trauma to some extent, so I devoted a long time building the methodology for this consultation and in a trauma-informed way before doing and after the, the consultations. And one of the things was to pay survivors for their expertise. Um, to avoid this exploitation, to asking these people to share their, their stories over and over again, don't compensate them financially for it. Um, and there was an overwhelming you know, consensus on the need to build such a network. And also, uh, we've heard stuff like, I've never been heard like this before. This was the best engagement I've ever had. So we were you know, influenced by this overwhelming positive feedback to actually build a network but if we want to build something that is led by survivors to serve survivors and try to create system systematic reforms in sport, we cannot replicate in our governance structure the same system that we criticize. So I don't see myself as the leader of the network. I see myself as a facilitator. And I rely on an amazing group of five people from Mali, from Argentina, um, from Singapore, from the United States, people who were impacted by different types of, of harms and we together decide everything that we do with the network. We dedicated um, six months to build the strategic plan and a governance structure of the network. And it's interesting because the first thing I thought, I, I came to the meeting and said, I'm prepared, let's do it, you know, let's define our mission, our vision, and so on. And then, then someone said, no, 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 we gotta build the agreements here. How are we gonna invite difficult conversations among us? So we took a step back and we built something that we call the community agreements which is like, how are we gonna respectfully disagree? You know, and it's positive. It was positive. We built that, we defined our mission, our vision, our goals, our values, our activities, built on what we heard from the needs assessment. Uh, so within this network, that is a program of the Sport and Rights Alliance, we are challenging the common status quo from sports governing body and response that we usually get that is too complicated to deal with survivors. These people are too traumatized. And the true story is survivors are part of the solution. We're not part of the problem. The moment that someone speaks up about a harm that they suffered in, in sport, this is a proof that the system has failed. So you have the obligation to invite these people in to be part of the solution. Um, I'm not the kind of a person who thinks these are the bad guys, these are the good guys. I un understand that there are you know, interpersonal re relationships, and I do believe that one of the solutions to harassment and abuse in sports is the effective engagement of people impacted by it in all decision-making process. You cannot, you cannot try to build a solution without the people who suffered the harm, and they have the right to. So that's something that we do with the network. Like one, one of our goals is accountability. How do we hold sports governing bodies accountable um, towards a safe sport pathway that is sustainable? Um, while working on prevention, response, and remedy. 
And one of the things that we're going to do within the network is to provide an emergency fund because no one profits from disclosing a case of abuse or harm in sport. It's the opposite. It's the other way around. So we're going to have this small fund, which is a, f a financial form, a remedy for people to you know, use a psychological aid, legal aid, because navigating trauma is nonlinear, it is hard, and there is no finish line. So that's what we're going to try to do for the next three years. Um, I think um, it's not an easy job. I, I feel like a lot of responsibility under my shoulder and everything I come up, whenever I come up to a meeting, the first thing is please that, let, that the words that comes out of my mouth doesn't harm anyone, you know, to acknowledge intention versus impact because I might have the best intentions in the world but I might impact someone negatively. And because my intentions were positive, it doesn't mean that the impact are invalid of what the person is feeling is invalid. So that's how we're trying to navigate and collaborate with sports governing bodies as well as the International Olympic Committee, um, FIFA, FIBA, and other sports governing bodies, while we also amplify the efforts of many other athletes who are trying to bring this systemic change to sport. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. And it's very interesting what you said about uh, participation, because I think that um, one of the main, um, the main um, elements um, of, of my mandate is indeed, the main priorities is indeed participation, participation in cultural life and participation in, in sports, but also participation in any decision making. So, you know, so how can you have um, uh, decisions without the people who were um, affected by the current uh, situation and not just um, have them as a in a tokenistic way just to parade them here and there but have them in the inception of the solutions in the reevaluation of the solutions in the delivery of the solution so I think that you know in all specific um, parts of the of the solution and I also like of course what you're doing because it means that it's it empowers again the people to know your the, the work and the, um, the um, help that, um, that you have decided at all to, to give this fund, it empowers people. I said empowers uh, people and somebody has told me that people are already empowered. So it, it allows them to be, um, you know, to show how empowered they, they are. So that's, that's brilliant. And then we have um, uh, Gino, who also, Alford, who also uh, for the last 20 years or so empowers um, and, and uh, works in empowering uh, athletes. Now she's in the World Players Association and she focuses on um, the player right, uh, rights um, strategy to recognize professional athletes as workers, as human rights defenders, and as people with intersecting identities that we talked about um, today. Um, previous, Gino has uh, worked in uh, various places where sports um, was at, um, at their core uh, work and um, she was a university soccer player in the US. So um, I'm, I'm very interested to hear maybe a different perspective to uh, discrimination on the grounds that we have seen, but, um, but very interestingly, especially when it comes to um, labor rights but also other rights. Thank you. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and on this panel. It's my first time at Brunel University and I've been so utterly charmed by the student body and the faculty and the campus and the weather today. Uh, we even <laughs> predict the weather for you. The sun, we brought the sun. <laughs> uh, but it, it feels like running a, a relay and you know, here I am the anchor leg, but the first three runners did so well that I'm really just gonna be able to coast uh, in to bring this home. Um, but it is true, I've been working on sport and human rights for quite a while now. Uh, and yet really excited about the conversation today um, because Brunel is such a great home uh, for the, the conversation, already has the history and, and legacy uh, standing here. And then also bringing the cultural right lens. I think the participation in sport uh, really focuses the discussion on human rights in sport. And quite often uh, we see the the discussions at, in the human rights system really excited and energized about the human rights through sport. And sometimes discussions about human rights abuses in sport is a little bit inconvenient. And so they tend to get tokenized um, and, and brought into the mix, uh, but considered quite difficult and inconvenient. Um, and so I like what Joanna said about uh, you know, the uh, 
athletes with lived experience are very much part of the solution, uh, but not when um, the power of sport is exercised um, sort of at their expense, um, rather than recognizing the power of sport as the power of the people in, in the games. Uh, so if, I, if you'll indulge me with a little bit of, of my, um, my athlete journey, even though it's quite much more mundane um, than, than my fellow panelists, um, but it illustrates a little bit uh, both those you know, positive benefits and then the, the potential, the negative risks um, that come with it. So I moved around a lot as a child between Alabama. So I know you guys are very familiar with the, the <laughs> cultural context there, if you know To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, and Guatemala. Um, my, typically, my sisters and I were the only uh, Baha'i children in our schools, in our communities. Um, my mother uh, from Iran faced a lot of, you know, everyday barriers and discrimination. Uh, and so we, we grew up with this and all of us used sport to uh, try to fit in, to, um, to try to make friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, belonging was really important. This was something that, uh, as a multi-sport athlete, um, was a tool. It was a social tool uh, for, for me. Um, and it was also a passion, uh, sometimes a talent, not always, uh, where, um, you know, during the 90s when soccer became, uh, you know, quite a craze for women and girls in the US, uh, I jumped on the bandwagon. And I did play uh, at university for three years and you know, dreamed of uh, becoming a, a professional athlete uh, in the, uh, women's, uh, the U women's United Soccer Association, which folded uh, you know, after three years because of underinvestment. Uh, so I, I quickly pivoted my, my senior year of university to become a sports uh, editor. And uh, I think I, I turned my, um, my uh, disappointment about what happened with, uh, with professional women's soccer on my athletic department uh, at my school and exposed all kinds of uh, inequality and disparity uh, within the, the women's and men's programs, um, including scholarships and access to facilities. Uh, so my, my first couple jobs out of uh, university landed me in that uh, small club of women sports uh, journalists, uh, which gave really a, a front row seat to um, the, the type of discrimination that women in sports uh, faced uh, as players, as uh, executives, as uh, journalists. Um, the you know, abuse and uh, harassment was um, a bit more hidden, but you know, definitely there. Uh, so when you know, I, I, I really felt like this wasn't um, it wasn't a healthy work environment, and uh, sort of moved on from from reporting sports and and uh, decided to become a, a human rights defender. I think I had a little bit of Atticus Finch uh, <laughs> in me as well. And uh, you know, years later, I found myself at Oxford University. Um, this is where I met Alex uh, the first time. And uh, you know, uh, this was uh, missed my first day of class actually because I was out late watching the uh, 2014 Men's World Cup, um, which was you know late uh, for for England, and then out partying afterwards with some overjoyed uh, German fans uh, <laughs> from from their victory. Um, but that you know truancy, school truancy. This don't. Not, not for the students in, in the class, but it led me to the idea to do a paper on you know, what are uh, FIFA's uh, human rights responsibilities. And uh, it, it was great timing because the next year was 2015. This was the Women's World Cup in Canada. And uh, FIFA and the Canadian Soccer Association were forcing the world's top women players uh, to compete on uh, dangerous and inferior artificial turf. Uh, the players brought a collective complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal in Ontario and immediately faced uh, reprisal threats. They were threatened with uh, you know, being cut from the, the national teams. They were uh, given all kinds of sporting sanctions. And um, eventually they decided to uh, drop their complaint uh, because kind of like what's been said, you know, they, they really just wanted to play. And it was a really fragile stage of the development of their game. And you know, faced with the two options, uh, not playing was worse uh, than playing on artificial turf. Um, 
So, of course, the only thing left for me to do after all of this was to um, throw myself into making sport at the international governance level comply with international human rights standards. Because when FIFA and the Canadian Soccer Association and every other uh, national football federation that threatened these women, when they told them that they would be cut from their teams, um, it was actually in line with the FIFA statutes, uh, this uh, forced arbitration clause. Um, not too long afterwards, FIFA did add a, um, a human rights uh, provision. Article 3 and 4 are you know, embedding international human rights standards, but that forced arbitration, arbitration clause is still there, uh, even though uh, the bodies, the dispute resolution chamber, the court of arbitration of sport, um, are not fit for purpose for bringing a human rights complaint. Um, but if uh, a, a victim of a human rights violation brings a complaint to, to a court of law that's fit for purpose for that, they're considered in violation of their um, you know, contractual agreements, their participation agreements in sport. Uh, so I've been working closely with a lot of the people in this room, and I, I think it's you know, uh, worth kind of taking stock of where we are as, as the community. Um, you know, FIFA and um, the International Olympic Committee, they uh, definitely look a lot different now in terms of uh, where their conversation on human rights stand. Uh, they have large departments with lots of people with titles uh, that are focused on human rights, and so they're very busy doing a lot of work on safeguarding athletes, on child rights in sport, on uh, anti-discrimination. So there's effort being made and definitely um, engagement to be done. And at the governance level, we know that the one area that they resist the most is giving athletes uh, an equal say in the governance of the game. And I think that's where this conversation about labor rights um, comes back. Because for them, that really challenges the status quo and it challenges this imbalance of power um, that for them, they're, holding, they're clinging on to. Um, just, I think, for fear of change. Uh, when you look throughout the history of uh, the professional unionized sports movements, all of them uh, faced that claim at the beginning of the efforts to unionize that sport will not survive unionization of this athlete, that athlete. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert, every single one of those uh, industries, sport industries that have unionized are thriving. They've done much better because once the athletes are given that kind of uh, protection, once they're given that sort of um, commercial uh, empowerment and, and voice in the game, uh, then you know, everyone sort of comes to the table and does what's in the best interest of the athletes because they have that um, you know, dedicated, independent uh, voice to safeguard their interests. And you know, if athletes are, in fact, interested in the longevity of their industry, they're not going to do anything to undermine that viability. Uh, so this is something that um, I think at the, the global level in sports that um, are within a team sport environment and outside of that um, are all beginning to evolve. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, organizing happening from the athlete level. Uh, a lot of it is tied to abuse. I think there is a lot of recognition that um, the fragmentation of the sports industry, the precarity, uh, of the industry, um, and also a lot of the other cultural norms of you know, young children coming into the game without uh, forming identities outside of that athlete identity uh, has created um, heightened risks. And so the more that athletes are able to find um, their identity, their holistic identity outside of simply being um, you know, competitors, uh, that, that empowers them. And that's something that, from a worker point of view, um, is, is where we're heading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that this idea of um, this, this element of the international governance and generally the governance of sport is um, quite uh, interesting to unpack. Um, the reality is that uh, the, the governance of sport is not very... Um, well known to the everyday person and, and the rights and responsibilities of uh, any athlete are not very well known. So um, 
and, and you are right, people who moan are often seen as people who moan and they should just get back to, to the game. Um, so I think that we have quite a lot of work to, to do with this. It's also very interesting what you said about um, the human rights defense, but the, you know, these athletes can be seen as human rights defenders and, and in cultural rights, we have cultural rights defenders. And as you were talking, I was thinking, we've talked about that before, but as uh, you were talking, I was thinking maybe we should have a sports rights defenders. Um, so, so human rights defenders are people who um, uh, defend human rights not for their own good, for, but for a wider good. So maybe, you know, people who um, raise issues in sports um, for the wider good should, should get um, recognition as human rights defenders or some kind of specific rights defenders. Um, but I've, I've uh, had the... Um, the privilege to talk to our um, guests too much um, questions and comments from the audience. Uh, would you like to first say your name and, and whether you're from Brunel or from another organization and, and please if you can keep the comment or question uh, quite uh, succinct so that um, as many can um, have their say. Thank you. Thank you. Can we wait for the microphone maybe? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Joe, and I happen to be an international football agent and also an alumni of Bruno. Thank you. Uh, my question is straight to Inyola. Um, when it comes to human rights in terms of sports, it has to do with the athletes and their rights to engage in sports activities. Now, I want to talk about majorly in the space of football. What do you have to say about unspoken racism? And how do you think, I repeat myself, how do you think it can be combated? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think the, the term unspoken racism, um, I, I, I'm assuming that you relate to this sort of, um, I think someone else said it, it's this sort of dome of silence um, that it, it sort of feeds into this culture of um, just just get on with it and play, um, even though you're, you're li literally your human rights are being affected. Um, I, I think ultimately um, that can only change when you call it out and you, you, you go against the silence and you, you, you make it known. Um, I can only speak for myself, that's how it changed for me and, and for the England women's team, was to make it known what this culture was. And you can only really deal with something once you address, once you address it. And a lot of these cultures are elephants in the room. People know it's going on, um, but don't want to do anything about it. And I think that I'm happy that we've reached a time now in sport uh, where athlete activism is um, at its all-time high, um, whether that's you know kneeling in NFL, whether that's you know um, uh, women in sport being very open about you know their experiences in sexual harassment um, or racism uh, it, across sport, I'm seeing athletes stand up and say no, this is the culture, we're not going to accept this anymore. Um, and that, that culture of silence or that unspoken racism or sexism or misogyny or abuse or harassment then becomes something that the world is aware of. Um, it's hard, it, it's, it's, it's not fun at all, but you have to call it out um, to deal with it. In, in, my, in my experience, you know, I think using the media sometimes helps as well because the media amplifies a lot of these stories. You know, I've, I've worked with some journalists who were absolutely passionate about changing the status quo as much as I was. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think it's about making it known and, and, and without addressing that elephant in the room, you can't, you can't remove the elephant. You know, that's just the way it has to be. Thank you. Uh, maybe the lady? Yes, Pink. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, I'm uh, Misha Jervis. I'm a sports psychologist at Brunel. Um, I've worked a lot with abuse, um, worked with the, the gymnasts who were abused um, from the White Review. I did all of the psychological support for them. But I'm working, uh, my question really is to you, Gigi, I'm working with a group of ice hockey players who've experienced extreme concussions and their lives are in bits. Um, alcoholism, depression, suicidal ideation, suicides, um, because the rate of concussions that they have experienced is, is extraordinary. And so I'm wondering, in terms of um, changing their rights as employees, yeah. where they feel like they're commodities, um, how do they get to have a voice? And how then, you know, it, it, it's for other people's entertainment for their lives to be decimated after they leave the sport. So I'm interested in what you think about that. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that question. It's something shared across a lot of the, these contact sports. Um, and, and certainly for every athlete, there's an element of the, the physical dangers uh, of their, their game. Um, and this is very much a, a workplace health and safety concern uh, and should be immediately treated as such. I can share some of the best practice that we've seen within our unions that have uh, you know, done the, the bargaining and, and negotiating around um, preventing and, and mitigating these risks. Um, you know, it starts from the research and the evidence, and, and I do think there were decades where uh, you know, we weren't doing anything about this uh, just across the board, um, whether it was you know, football, American football, whether it was international football. Um, and now that's beginning to tip in the other direction. And certainly, you know, I would hope in ice hockey it, it is. And, and from what I've seen in North America, it has. Uh, so pointing to the best practices is the first place to start. But then I think from there, it's understanding where the industrial relations um, dynamic is really important because the players have power, their strength in numbers. And if they're not able to uh, stand in that solidarity together to say this is a collective concern, um, you know, not only from a uh, liability uh, problem, because that's what we've seen in the sports that didn't have a strong industrial relations negotiating uh, existing relationship, uh, they went into, um, uh, you know, liability mode, right? They were protecting the institution rather than protecting the people. And uh, you don't have that um, option if there's, you know, uh, if you're sitting at the table and you're agreeing to a contract and in those contracts you're going to make sure that there are health and safety provisions. And I think that's the, the place to start. But if they don't have uh, a union representation, then that's, that's where it all starts. Um, asking the sports bodies you know, to do the right thing will only take them so far. And then when the next you know, horizon of harm is uncovered, they have to start all over. Whereas if they begin with the basic principles of having that relationship of, you know, I'm an employee, you're the employer, we have you know, a bargaining relationship, then you can handle these problems when they come up. Um, and the players are always the ones who, you know, have the research, have their, you know, they're going to take care of themselves if they're able. Thank you. Another question? Daniela? Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Daniela Herr from the Center for Sport and Human Rights. And just want to start with thanking all of you for being so courageous to speak about your stories. Um, really, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I do want to continue a bit on the last thing you mentioned, Genus, on, on research. Given that we are at a university, um, I wonder about the role that research can play here. I think, um, I mean, if we look around the room, there are a lot of incredible people doing incredible work. We know from your stories that there is a lot of evidence base on what is going wrong. Um, a lot of facts have been uncovered. Just, it's a question to all of you. I don't know who wants to answer. What 
else can research do to help your cause? Like where should research focus on next or in addition to help your cause, but also to help, you know, mandates like Alexandra's mandate to, to write important reports? Um, I don't know who would like to answer that. <laughs> I can give it a try. Um, I think that research is fundamental to give us um, more stuff when we come to the table with sports governing bodies. And I've been doing this since I started doing this job. And that was kind of the reason why I wanted to do the prevalence study in Brazil, because back then it was me sharing my story. And then, hey, but I've been here in front of from other athletes. Now it's like scientific evidence that this is a systematic problem in Brazil. Does research have the power to change policies? It depends. But it can, and it might. And I think it's very important for us advocates, because I see myself more today as an advocate rather than a researcher, uh, for advocates to make sure that we rely on research when we come to those meetings. I mean, I've been to meetings with sports governing bodies where, where I was the only survivor with people with, who have a lot of power, you know, president of NOCs and president of federation. It's not an easy job to be. It's not an easy position to be in. First, because I'm incapable of speaking on behalf of all people with lived experience. I can talk about my experience. So I had to make sure to find the right tone to say it cannot be just me. It has to be diverse voices, because even though I might have similar experience compared to others, the way people perceive the way forward or the solution, it might be different. I do not have all of, of the answers. So I think that's when research helps. Um, I think when it comes, I, I think measuring the extent of violence in sport, all types of violence, I mean the instrument that I used was psychological, physical and sexual violence. I think there are other types of violence that needs to be there from an intersectional lens. Uh, but apart from measuring the extent of violence, we need to understand what do those stakeholders perceive as violence? Because we are talking about a culture that normalizes behaviors. Uh, we are just uh, taught to know, you know, you just have to take it. You have to do 10 times 400 IM on five minutes or you'll not make to the Olympic level, even though my, sho my shoulder was injured. So there's a whole culture and we have to understand this is the extent, this is the number. 50% of those athletes have suffered physical violence. But only 10% of them understand what you have measured as physical violence as physical violence. So when you're gonna educate or think of prevention, because that's something we hear a lot when we talk to sports governing bodies. I'm gonna fix it, I'm gonna give this online course for 500 coaches, problem fixed. But if you don't monitor and you evaluate to make sure that, the, you know, that you're shifting the, the culture, what's the point? And when you have a prevalence research, I mean, most of the prevalence research, they found um, an increased percentage of physical violence from peer-to-peer -peer athletes on team sports. So if I work for sports governing bodies of a team sport, that's where I'm, I'm going to start with. So that's when research might help. So I'm rumbling here, but I would say that it's very important now for us to have more research in the global south to mm -hmm. understand. Um, and we need to uh, understand what do these athletes who are the most vulnerable perceive as violence. I would just like to add to that slightly with the, the publishing of research. Um, I think that um, a lot of a lot of issues, certainly in women's sport, are written about and talked about, um, and obviously expressed from the people that are, are suffering from it. But um, the research then comes after, and it almost looks as if um, you're sort of trying to back up your point and, and, and make an argument. And there's this sort of binary. You know, I'll use an example. So I recently said that I don't believe, given the amount of sexism and misogyny and racism online towards women in sport, that stadiums, going to stadiums, is going to be, is perceived as a safe experience for women. I know that there's loads of data to support that, um, but that data hasn't been published yet. That research hasn't been published yet. So that left me open to, you know, that's just you imagining it, this sort of gaslighting experience. But what would have been really helpful would be the prominence of the research that's out there that, that 
people can digest very quickly and go, okay, we see the problem. Because numbers do that, it's a really easy thing to see numbers and go, okay, that, that's clearly a problem. Um, so I think the publication of easily digestible research and data around a lot of these very really difficult issues actually makes it easier to talk about. Um, and it, it sort of, it, it supports it supports people to talk about it um, in a way that I find I think it's just easier and more digestible. Um, may I just quickly follow up on that? Because this is such an important point. And one of the, thing, the things that we want to do within the network is we're going to have a survivor that works with research to make sure that this person can think of creative ways to translate scientific knowledge. We can do this through infographics, written summaries, videos. I don't know. Think of ways that we can reach to a broader audience and I've mentioned the global south, so that's something really important to consider is translation. Not everyone speaks English and people are not obliged to speak English. So if we want to have an intersectional approach and then talk about the most vulnerable and have an approach from the global south, we need to consider translation in, in everything that we do. And it's also something that we're trying to do with the network, um, translating all, all the documents, all the webinars, um, and this f future program on um, I don't even know how we call it, research analysis, communication. We're going to make, make sure to translate that as well. Thank you. And then what I want to know is, um, <laughs> how did your friends feel when they, they were told that, you know, unless they remove their um, headgear, they cannot play? What effect did it have to them as a young women in general? And maybe what effect it had on their families, their environment, the community? I think the, the consequences were very different. Um, because me, for example, I never had the ambition to become a professional player. But I know people whose dream and whose life plan was based around becoming a professional player like Jabba, for example, who went to play in the States and now wants to go back, but she, she can't play in France. So I think the, the consequences were very different. I think some, I know that some just stopped playing basketball together. Some stopped playing sport altogether. So this is a public health issue, a, a psychological issue um, as well. I know that some girls doubted. They said, am I in the wrong? Is this rule fair? Is this rule legal? Should I take off my hijab off? Some even went as far as doubting their faith. Should I compromise my faith? Because if I'm not playing basketball, then what am I going to do? So I think that the consequences were varied a lot. And on their families, I think it's very, so I can't speak for them, but I think it's very helpful to have your child, your sister, your friend uh, be prohibited and prevented from playing the sport that they love. But I think for most of them, it, it's, it also got them tighter with their family and also with their teammates because um, we talk about family and, and the players, but the teammates and the coaches and the clubs were also heavily affected because you're seeing your, your teammate who's m most likely a friend and she can play. And so how do you feel? You feel guilty. You don't know if you have to play or not. If you're the head coach, you don't know how to say to sometimes young girls that they can play. You don't know how to say to the parents, your little girl won't be able to play. And sometimes the work that you've put in creating and developing a female section in your club is ruined because next year, most of us won't get a license anymore because we won't pay to stay on the bench for 40 minutes. That's impossible. And so it's, it's destroying women's basketball, women's French basketball. It's destroying careers and it's destroying passions. Did it make you feel more equal to men? Did it make them? <laughs> this is what the Fran this is what Fran says that this is about gender <laughs> discrimination. Yeah. Did it make you feel then more equal to men? Uh, it made me feel more unequal to to men because uh, men. I mean, even though you know men from minority minority religions also face discrimination, they're not as visible as us. And they don't ask us to take their clothes off. They're not, you know, humiliated and stigmatized as we are. Um, and sometimes as on a personal level, I was also very disappointed to see men be free to play and not consider what women might be feeling because they were 
in that situation, in a situation of privilege. And we're supposed to share the same passion and the same values and the same love for the sport. But you're not speaking up, you're not backing us, and you're not being an ally. So it may be sometimes feel even um, more distance from basketball players, men basketball players. Is that, is that now a sort of a legitimate argument that there's now equality and discrimination? France would say that it is about neutrality. So this is what France, the response of France was very much, in our communication was very much about neutrality. So that, um, you know, at the public sphere, we all have to be, um, we, we leave our, it's very hard for me to keep it, <laughs> but we leave our elements of identity aside because we're all French. Um, and this relates very much. And no, <laughs> yeah, we are perplexed too. So, uh, <laughs> please. If oh, sorry. Yeah, I, sorry, I just one second. To say how, how sad it is to know that in 2024 we're having this conversation mm -hmm. because in 2017, Elin was saying that FIBA already, you know, uh, overturned this ban uh, and, and followed other sports that had done it before. So it really is uh, a step backwards. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, just I, I wanted to highlight one good story that I've heard over the past uh, month of Ramadan, where if you have been following in, in football, the steps towards inclusion that are being made to offer uh, ways to support uh, players who are fasting, to make sure that they're taking care of their health, to making sure that they have a way to uh, break their fast, to observe their, their religion, and play football. It's been a real step forward. Um, and, and I remember uh, when I was 15 and first started fasting that you know, I had to really choose between my identities. You know, and I had to kind of leave my, my faith at the you know, sidelines and then step on the field and in you know, the, the blazing heat, um, you know, suffer through dehydration and, uh, and had no one I could really talk to to be able to integrate those identities. And you know, we, I thought we had come so far. And then I find out that actually in France, they've even banned pausing uh, at sundown for uh, breaking the fast, for just drinking water, because they see that as an overt religious symbol. And that's something that violates les cités. And it just feels like we're living in parallel worlds where you know, we, have, we know now how to be more inclusive, how to show uh, equality, how to practice diversity. Uh, and this is just a, a real deliberate um, slight that, you know, uh, of, of all people, you know, women and girls in sport should not be bearing the brunt of, of this discussion. Indeed. David, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just said, uh, just thank you all so much for just, again, your just amazing willingness and courage to be vulnerable, but also just, you know, for the work that you're doing. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, Would you like to introduce yourself? Sorry? Just to say who you are. Oh, yes, sorry. David Grevenberg with the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Um, this is clear in listening to each one of you, really, uh, that we have a systems and structural failure in sport. And you know, I do a lot of looking back. My, my previous role with the Commonwealth Games Federation, I was their chief executive, and then um, a lot of work in that particular space. I kind of looked at root causes as to why we were in the big brand dilemma that we were in, but more importantly, why we were not able to progress forward. And one of the things that just listening to the four of you tonight, going back to structure and, and systems analysis, I really, there's a clear delineation here that cast structures in sport are alive and well in terms of lower caste and higher caste, in terms of whether that's race, whether that's gender, whether that's identity being. And I think that that really is something uh, that has come very clear as you were speaking. I think patriarchy and, and the remnants of colonial legacies are following through. You see it in France. You see it in how you know, the entire population of France is not being embraced. Um, and a lot of that is colonial 
constructs and, and has that, uh, and it exists here in the UK, uh, it's quite prevalent. I guess my question in that context, in terms of systems and structures, and the lack of leadership, appropriate leadership to be able to address these issues, which I think is it's also a lack of leadership. What is the number one thing, if you could have changed today, what would it be? What, if you could change something tomorrow, one thing, for each of you, what would that be that would make things better? Gosh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> How about Sorry. two, two yeah, things? Two, okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. Like, just one minute, just two. So, do you want to start? I can give it a try. <laughs> In one so, minute? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the root causes are the power imbalance. And the only way to balance it to, is to outbalance. Sorry, the... So the only way to balance is to outbalance. So we have more people that today has less power, having the power to make decisions. And we also have a problem from a governance structure on the autonomy of sports. It regulates itself. When it comes to the rules of the game, I'm 100% in favor. When it comes to human rights violations, no. Um, so, focusing on harassment and abuse, I, I hope I still have a couple of sec seconds. Um, I would like to see the IOC having a safeguarding, safe sport code, whatever framework. And I also would like to, to have, I don't know, UNESCO to build a convention on safeguarding as well, so we can hold member states together in harmony. I know this is not the solution, but thinking of a governance perspective, these are the things that I would choose. But, Joanna, also, you would like to have the United Nations monitoring bodies 100%. discuss violations in sports in the same way that they discuss violations in socioeconomic rights. Yes. Because yeah. usually they're just, uh, when there's accountability, that's only when in terms of corruption and scrutiny, but when it comes to violation of human rights, not so much. Exactly. So that's where we need to tackle. Yeah. Helen, have you decided what you want to change? Uh, <laughs> I would want to say the past, but that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, will say, I would say include Islamophobia as a discrimination, because sometimes we talk about racism and anti-Semitism, that's great, but where is Islamophobia in the text? And I would like to have this sort of violence recognized also as a gender-based violence. And for that we need financing research and we need French people to understand that we also need ethnic statistics, which are prohibited in France, and we need to recognize that we suffer specific discriminations and that our rights, fundamental rights, are just like any others, they must be respected. Thank you. And Iola? Yeah, I, I think if you could ask me, the, for me, the end goal, whenever I'm sort of having these difficult conversations or trying to instigate change is accountability. I think as human beings, when we are held accountable, that's when change starts to happen. Changed behavior starts to happen. So I always shoot for the, the, the solution that is going to hold the most powerful people accountable. So whether that's the court of law, whether it's you know, the UN, whoever can help me on that, I'll be their friend. <laughs> um, so I, I, I and, and specifically accountability when it comes to women in sport, um, sexism, I'm appalled that misogyny is not a hate crime in this country despite you know, um, there being a Quality Act, despite there being, you know, obviously um, uh, protected characteristics that, that equate to women. Um, I, I don't know why that's the case, but I'm hoping that's gonna change soon. So accountability for, I think, all the people that sort of uh, are currently abusing um, women in sport online. Uh, clearly, there's a lack of regulation of online um, uh, platforms like mm -hmm. X. Um, so I'm working on that. I'm talking to government, talking to lots of different actors on how we're going to change that. Thank you. Gigi? Those are three good answers. I, don't, <laughs> I, I would say I would want the three of them running the sports bodies. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! Yeah. laughs> uh, IOC president, FIFA president, FINA president, FIBA president, and then you know we'll be done. We can all go home. <laughs> and, and since uh, you know, I can, I can uh, answer the question for me, uh, I think that for me it, it would be really important for states to realize that they have legal obligations based on the international human rights treaties they have signed and ratified when it comes to obligations towards um, obligations in sport, uh, athletes and, and people engaged in sports. And I think that you know, this is what 
the next three years are going to be about in my mandate. But thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And uh, please come and join us for a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you.